another member of the family decided to sell to a neighbouring proprietor, even though it was entailed, which, of course, you can't get away with. So uh, what happened was in 1764, a legal case went to the court of session uh, and they decided that, in fact, the entail should stand. And that is why the owner of the, uh, of the estate is given as A. Laurie of Redcastle, uh, who was the husband of the lady who complained against the entail being broken. So maybe once this uh, legal case had been sorted out in 1764, the map was then made, which um, may be not true at all, but it sounds quite likely. Well, Archie. Oh, yes, Archie wants to say something about the letter E. I've just remembered. Go on, Archie. This is, this is we're moving to the letter E. Um, uh, just to say, there is another McCartney map without a date on it, which is the Carling Walk one of the Marling ah, map yes. in Castle Douglas, which is worth a good look if you want to go on to the NLS site. Um, all I wanted to say about the letter E, this is the word explanation, and that first florid, flamboyant looking thing is a letter E. You don't see many E's like that these days. Um, McCartney really enjoyed his penmanship, and it's worthwhile looking not just at McCartney's maps, but quite a lot of other ones who just enjoy the flamboyance of um, playing around with a pen and making beautiful shapes with it. Uh, James and uh, not so much his father, John, but uh, James Tate was another one who loved putting squiggly bits and curly cues and everything else on. So it's something else to look out for and enjoy when you're looking at the maps. So this um, particular map, I'm just gonna give a little bit of context about the map and then I'm gonna bring Archie in to talk about what the map is actually all about towards the end. So. Uh, first of all, um, this is one, this is not a map standing on its own, this is one of 17 maps that cover the barony of the whole of Calaverock, which is pretty well the whole parish, existing parish of Calaverock. Uh, and they're all bound into a fairly small volume. Um, and I'm, I'm just showing you this one out of the 17 as an example. As you can see, the layout of the uh, of the book is fairly straightforward. You've got the plan on the right and on the left you can see a table uh, and that's called the abstract of contents and it just gives you the land measurements, the area measurements in uh, um, acres, roods and falls, which Chris is going to actually explain a little bit more about later on, uh, about land measurement and linear land measurement as well. So we'll have a look at that a, a little bit later on. Uh, so that's the layout and the date of the map is either 1775 or 1776. We don't quite know which because the only clue we've got is in the title page to this volume uh, where the survey um, took two years and we don't know which year this map was done in. The surveyor, and now we're really getting onto the good stuff because I like the surveyors. The surveyor was James Wells and James Wells was one of the most prolific and accurate and I think produced some of the most attractive maps that were made in the late 18th century in this area. Um, his professional life lasted from at least 1756 to 1791. And I just want to mention briefly here about connections between surveyors. Surveyors are very important in the whole land improvement process in, in Scotland. Yes, they were there just to, to make plans but they also had vast experience of different forms of uh, land and different landowners and what they were doing. And I'm sure they did a lot more than just uh, act as, um, uh, as, uh, as draftsmen. Uh, and in fact, we know that some of them worked as factors on estates as well. So they had an important role to play. And how were they all connected? Where did they get their training? Th these are questions which, um, we want to find out more about, especially in this area. Uh, we know, for instance, uh, going back briefly to uh, talking about the first map that we looked at, which was the uh, James Leslie map. Now, James Leslie made a copy of a Peter May map, and Peter May is probably the surveyor we know most about of any in Scotland, and that's because he left a whole load of correspondence, or it, it survived, uh, in this particular 
uh, and it's been edited and produced in this book here, Peter May Land Surveyor, uh, published by the Scottish History Society about nearly 40 years ago. Uh, but it's an excellent book. And this little chart here, which I'm just going to hold up, you can see that. You don't need to read it, it's okay. But that looks like a family tree. But it's not a family tree. What it actually is, it's the Northeast School of Land Surveyors, the passage of professional skills through a proven master trainee relationship for 120 years. And this was put together by Ian Adams, who was a, an early worker in, the, uh, in, in, this, in this field, uh, an early researcher, did a huge amount of work in the 1960s and 70s. Now, that's been done for the Northeast. It has not been done for this area. And I think there's great potential. And one bit of speculation I'm going to indulge in straight away is that James Wells uh, might have been taught by a chap called Charles Mercer. Now, Charles Mercer was a very early surveyor in this, for this area. He was a Dumfries man. His professional life lasted from around about 1725 to 1751. But he was also a mathematician. Now, a lot of surveyors were just called mathematicians anyway, but we know that he taught people mathematics and had actually got a school in Dumfries, uh, which a lot of local people attended. And I can just imagine James Wells as a young lad, because he was a Dumfries man, going along to this school, learning the rudiments, and then starting off in the profession. Um, I, I do like speculating. So that's, uh, that's a bit about them. Going back to uh, John Leslie, um, we noted that he made the plan, that uh, he copied the plan that Peter May had done. Well, Leslie uh, also worked down in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, he made plans in the 1760s for the uh, Duke of Queensbury. And, uh, and also the plan that Peter May drew was copied again on a reduced scale in the 1790s by the very famous surveyor, John Ainsley. And Ainsley also worked down this area making county maps for Wigtonshire, published in 1782, and then for the Stuartry in 1797. So there was an awful lot of toing and froing, especially with the, the more well-known and important surveyors, right across Scotland. So there were connections like that, and there were also connections with training and, and learning. And I'll come back to that a little bit later when we look at some of the other maps. Graham, could you briefly, I've got a quick question here. Um, yes. Um, so, uh, Nick Coombe has asked this available online. I think um, uh, Gilbert has suggested they're all available online on, and, uh, on the uh, NLS website, but uh, someone's been looking for the, uh, this map on the NLS website. Is it available? Not yet. We're working on it. It's uh, due to be available shortly. We've got a, a couple of hundred maps just very shortly, hopefully heading up to Crest to go online. So this, yeah. this event we're talking about is basically a map premiere. Yes, it is. absolutely. This particular map, um, we've done a little bit about the surveyors and the physical side of the map. Uh, what about the historical side? Well, the who commissioned the survey is, is an interesting point. Nearly always it's the landlord that commissions the survey. Of course, the annexed estates are uh, a, different, a different matter but usually it's the landlord. In this case, the landlord was one William Maxwell of Nithsdale, uh, who was from a family that had owned this land since around about 1220, the Maxwells of Calaverock. They'd owned this land for a very, very long time already by this point, and they'd done pretty well. In the 17th century, they became the Earls of Nithsdale, uh, and they gradually uh, acquired more land through the centuries. But then they made some bad decisions, and one bad decision was to support the Jacobite cause in 1715, with the result that they lost the earldom. Uh, they would also have lost all their lands as well in the way that the Mackenzie lands were lost up north that we were just talking about. But instead, uh, the, fourth, the, the fourth earl, no, the fifth earl, who was uh, nearly executed in the tower for his part in the 1715, had very cannily three years before disdained his lands to his son, who was a minor still at the time, quite uh, young, about 12, I think. Uh, and the government were really annoyed about this because they, they, uh, they didn't think this should have happened. 
So what they what the government did was to then confiscate all the estate rents. So William, the youngster, got to keep the lands, but he had no income pretty well. So he fell into serious debt. There were a lot of landlords locally um, that he was, uh, landowners locally that he owed money to, uh, and this got to quite a, a serious state. And for the next 20, 30 years of his life, he was encumbered by, by the, this, this burden. But things gradually started to improve. And the first thing that happened was to, that made a bit of a difference was in 1746. And that's to do with the map we're looking at now. When the borough of Dumfries, that had been doing very well for the last 20 years or so uh, with trade, and especially the tobacco trade, the town had been flourishing, um, decided that they wanted to build a new outport for Dumfries. Uh, and they asked William Maxwell if he wanted, if he would be willing to sell some land at Glen Capel to them for the purposes. And he said, not only will I uh, give you the land, you won't even have to pay for it because I want that port to be built. So the building went ahead and the key, K-E-Y, that you can see there, uh, that was the first little key that was built for ships on at Glen Capel. Now, this map was done 20 years later and there's not a lot of evidence of building. The borough was fewing out plots in the village, but there weren't many takers at that point. However, trade was still going on. And in fact, the first ship we've got a record of uh, visiting the port uh, was a ship called the Success, a Dumfries ship in 1748 with a load of um, a cargo of uh, Virginia tobacco. So that was in a way as expected. In fact, it's quite interesting because the, the 1748 uh, ship um, the success is actually depicted on another map. It's depicted on the Edward Vernon map of the Craig's estate in 1740. Uh, uh, so we actually have a drawing of the ship as well on the map. Shows how all these connections between maps. Um, now, moving on a little bit to where the fortunes of the estate really started to take a turn for the better, which was in 1758 with the marriage of Winifred Maxwell the heir to the estates uh, from William. Um, William was still alive at this point, but Winifred married William Haggerston Constable of Everingham in Yorkshire. And this was a great marriage because he was an extremely wealthy man. And over the years, over the next 30 years, the estate gradually started to improve. And this map is part of the evidence of that improvement. Uh, so in 1758 as well, uh, a scheme of improvement for the estate was written. Uh, and I'm just going to very briefly here, because I've got to do this, uh, I'm going to give a plug for the Dumfries archives. Um, because th this, um, we know in detail about the scheme of improvement and all the other things that happened on the estate, because uh, we've got a collection of about 40 um, estate volumes of estate records for the Nithsdale estate in the Ewart Library. Um, if anybody's interested, the reference number is GGD525. Uh, I just know that. <laughs> uh, can't, can't get rid of it. So, we've got a great collection of estate records. Most of the other records of the estate are in Yorkshire still, in the um, uh, Hull History Centre, uh, because the base for the estate was over there after the marriage of uh, Winifred. But th th this collection is, is fantastic and we're just delving into it and a couple of volunteers, one in particular, has done a tremendous amount of job, a tremendous amount of work on, uh, on looking into the details of, of what was going on with agricultural improvement at the time on the estate. And Archie's going to quickly talk about that and I'm just going to leave you with how the rentals of Calaverock Parish changed and increased over the years since this map was made. So in 1758, the uh, rental value for the estate was £679. In 1772, just before this map was made, it had gone up a little bit, but not very much, to £902. But in 1795, it had gone up to £2,281, a really big surge in, in improvement in value. And Archie is now going to tell you how that came about. If you take a look at the map, um, just take an eyeful of it. Uh, you can actually see there's almost two maps 
in the one. There's one overlaid on another. Uh, we're just geo-referencing again. We, we don't do anything new these days. This has been done before. But uh, what we can see, if you look at the more organic shapes um, below the grid pattern, and uh, we can see uh, that this is very much a medieval landscape rather than anything else. If we look at the lettering, uh, we have O, which is outfield, um, C, which is um, uh, croft, and very normally it would actually be um, I, which would be infield on, on quite a lot of number of other maps. Um, then we've got down below, there's B for bog, and almost most importantly is the P for pasture. And if you look at the pasture land, it, it skates around the arable bits. And if you think about trying to get to any arable place, um, you can probably go there by treading on pasture land rather than on the arable fields. Um, you know, away down to the um, bottom right, um, you can skip down past the burn and uh, get into this patch down there too. Uh, you can see hedge lines as well, outlining the organic shapes. And then on top of this, James Wells has done his divisions, as they're called in the abstract. And basically, he's made three different farms. And somebody has uh, usefully written in the names in pencil, um, the later names in pencil. And I can't remember the bo bottom one's Banks. The next one up is uh, uh, Town Foot, I think. And uh, then there's Glen Capel Farm. And I think there's another name there as well. Um, but essentially, you've got the, these two maps, one on top of the other. Um, and you're looking, if you look underneath the grid pattern there, you can see the medieval open field system um, that is just now coming to an end. Um, the croft land um, is quite an interesting one. I suspect that the, the croft part of it would be tied to particular functions within the firm town and also perhaps with the harbour as well. Uh, but we, we don't really, really know. But most of them manuring, and I shall be majoring, majoring on manure at a later date, um, is uh, uh, probably going to go onto those areas that say C. Um, and uh, the outfield would be, um, how do you put it, meagre cropping, I think would be that. At a later date, on the first ordnance survey, for instance, you can see that um, these farms, uh, quite chunky lumps of land, but uh, just over 100 acres each, Scots acres, by the way, rather than English, they're bigger than English ones, but Chris will explain that in a minute. Um, uh, they were um, subdivided again into geometric shapes, but we haven't got those yet on these plans. And on some of the other plans within this same book, which incidentally is um, just a little bit smaller than A4, just to give you an idea of it. Um, on some of the other plans, you do have somebody's written in with, with pencil and things. But uh, that's uh, why it's an exciting map to me anyway, is this uh, double mapping, if you like, on top of, the, uh, on top of each other. This, uh, as you can see um, from the title here, is a plan of Woodhead, including portions of the adjacent parish, adjacent farms in the parish of Cast Fairn, the property of the Honourable Mrs. McAdam Cathcart of Craig and Gillam, and it's surveyed by A.E. That's Alexander E. Thompson, Air 1838. So first of all, you've got the date, which is a lot later than any maps we've so far been looking at. This is right at the end of the uh, estate mapping period, just before the Ordnance Survey comes in. The first edition Ordnance Survey for this area was only 12 years after the date of this map. So it's actually starting to look a bit like an Ordnance Survey map, in fact. Um, now, the, uh, the map title um, is a bit of a giveaway because when you look uh, across at Karsfan Village, now that's the major settlement on the map by far, and you would have thought that the map would refer to the village, but there's, there's no mention of the village on the map. So what was it the map was being made for? Um, well, in fact, 
if you then uh, go back across to the wood head bit, that's why the map was made. It's not really uh, a farming map, an estate map, it's a mining map. And these are the new lead mines of Woodhead, which are just being developed at this time. And if you look at the 1839 statistical account, the new statistical account, the minister there says, the proprietor now has a number of miners employed, and there are more laborers employed than ever were in this parish at any former period. And these are what they're doing, those laborers, they're building these new houses, they're building all the machinery and the, and the places for the, uh, for the miners to work. And, uh, and this one also is not yet on the NLS site, you're quite right. Um, because we're, 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 we're uh, tempting you with these, and they soon will be. Um, so that's the, the, the lead mines there. Um, and the, the final thing I've got to say is that within another five years, uh, the minister of the parish uh, added a little addendum to the OSA, and he said that the proprietor, Colonel Cathcart, that's the husband of the lady who was mentioned, uh, takes a great interest in the mines. And in fact, um, there is now a, sen a scene of industry and activity which cannot be contemplated without astonishment. And Colonel Cathcart supervises the whole thing. So it was, this map was obviously his, his thing as well. He, he, he wanted this to show, there's a whole load of other things as you can see on the map, the hill features, and it, it's a lot of detail on it. But that's the main purpose for the map. Uh, Thompson, by the way, the surveyor, uh, was from Air and uh, often described himself as an engineer, which shows the way that the surveying trade was going. I'm afraid I've probably got, I've, I've nicked the two nicest maps to have a look at. I, <laughs> I, love, I love these both. They're, they're, they're absolutely terrific. If you remember the first map that we had a look at, um, it was all being very refined and very governmental, if you like. This one is actually a proper map of a proper estate and it's for the um, the landowner. First of all we've got our um, what do you call it cartouche here. Um, nice and florid again. Um, the writing's a little bit squint. 1769 so just after the one that was done up at Strathpeffer and uh, the bit that Graham really likes is the fact that the lady at the top of the picture has got a squint, if you look very carefully at it. Uh, there's all sorts of things to pick out on this, and one could spend a long time. I'm going to pick out one or two things that you may not immediately think of as being important. Um, but what we're trying to get to is a feel of the people that were there, and this map actually does it. You've got, you've got a garden that's, um, you know, organised and obviously looked after, You've got to the right of the Earlston there, you've got the Earlston Oak with all its um, Covenanter uh, resonances. Um, you've got the whole bit going on and around about, uh, we've got uh, um, woodland all the way and the woodlands are mentioned as far back as 1695, so uh, by Simpson. And uh, it's very much a, an estate that is the, um, or an area of land, if you like, that's the hub of the estate. Uh, that's the pigeon house. Now, the first thing to say is that in Dumfries and Galloway, these are relatively rare. In other places of, in Scotland, you see ducats and such like things um, uh, fairly frequently. But around here, it, it's not really the fashion. And I think that this actually tells us an awful lot about the person who organized this map and who is organizing this estate. Um, I don't know how to begin. It's all about dung again, I'm afraid. This is the pigeon house. Uh, obviously, there would be um, pigeons and squabs and such like to, to eat as well. Um, but actually, the reason for having pigeons um, both um, in this instance and uh, in it's more especially in uh, Roman agriculture um, was uh, for the dung. And you get this mentioned in uh, Columella and in Varro um, as uh, being uh, the thing to have um, in your, on your estate because pigeon dung is the best. 
And even now in the Middle East, you get pigeon houses with thousands of pigeons around and about. Um, and uh, there's, uh, how do you put it, fairly organized agriculture, organized around uh, pigeon dung and putting it on the estate and such like um, in, in the Middle East to this day. So um, this, I think, is um, uh, what's going on here. Uh, so it's more important than just a pretty thing uh, to have a look at. If we do a quick squint around and about, um, down below, we've got the gardener's house there. We'll just go on to there. Incidentally, pigeon dung. You put uh, two pounds of pigeon dung per year on your orchard trees. Um, gardener's farm. Gardener was important in those days as well because the, um, he was also the forester. And so you can see that just by looking at the map, you can see all these functions of the estate um, all depicted within the map, which is relatively rare, but it's a busy estate is the other thing I would have to say about it. Um, uh, there are things like uh, proper buyers, slate quarries, um, all sorts of things. Uh, and the other big part of it is right down the bottom is you have transport as well. Because down here, um, if you go to the bottom, Chris, there's your bang next door to Dalroy, and there's water transport all the way down the Ken and down the Loch and pretty much to the uh, rapids just north of Kukubri. And so, um, uh, for instance, Marl would come up here from um, uh, Castle Douglas and Carling Walk, um, and in return, timber would be sent back again. And there was uh, there's records of these transactions going on. So this is a, a, a busy little place as it was. There's uh, interesting uh, uh, juxtaposition, <laughs> if you like, of, of the um, pigeon house and uh, the, the polecat ligate. The fumart is the polecat. Um, interestingly, there's, there's also um, uh, brock holes uh, mentioned further down as well. So uh, they, they were interested in the uh, wildlife that was around and about because it, it gets a mention. So Archie, is, would you believe at least this is mentioned for them as a, a vermin species that you would be concerned about or would this be the early domestication of the polecat for hunting? Uh, no, I think that uh, it may well have been for hunting but actually uh, there's uh, plenty records of um, uh, Dumfries was a centre of um, uh, skin sales, believe it or not, especially for smaller animals. Um, so things like hares, rabbits, um, uh, such like things would have their skins sold through Dumfries. It was the central market for the south of Scotland. Um, and uh, something in, just off the top of my head, 1793, uh, there's something like 25,000 hare skins get sold through Dumfries. And that's all through the um, the, the south of um, Scotland. This one's got Cumbria Archive Service test written all over it, which uh, we thought was quite nice because it's a nice little advert for them. Um, currently, Dan get their um, maps uh, copied at, um, uh, down at Carlisle, and they do an excellent job there. They're pleasant, friendly, and relatively inexpensive, which is also a bonus. Um, uh, so that's why that's written across the middle of the middle of the screen. This map, uh, uh, this ma uh, previously, the, the map before incident, it was, belongs to Falkirk Archives. Um, this map uh, belongs to, um, very interestingly, the great, 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 great grandson of the surveyor. So Alistair, I think you're listening. Thank you very much indeed for this. And um, your uh, great, 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 uh, I'll have not to do this too often, but anyway, uh, he's done a, a wonderful job here, John Gillen. Uh, he also spells his name with an E sometimes and without an E sometimes, which is uh, a little bit confusing. But this is, this is definitely the John Gillen that we know. Um, this is uh, Michael Ross. Brig House and Balmangan. So on the um, western bank, if you like, of Kukubri Bay. 
and uh, it's uh, a terrific map. This belongs to the Elder Selkirk, based in the um, St. Mary's Isle, in the, um, uh, or just on the other side of the water here. Um, this map to me is not really about land and it's not really about sea, it's, it's really about halfway in between. So if we just go to the uh, Balmangan Bay and uh, uh, which is also known as uh, Ross Bay these days and we can see how people are using it. Um, we have the road passable through the bay, anywhere at low water. So people are, are walking across this um, uh, uh, fairly frequently to have that uh, put in. Um, and also, if you note, the road up here ends at that point. So you have to use the, the bay to get to the other side. Um, all around about, Gillen loves his boats for some reason or other. Um, he did a whole lot of the, um, the Maxwell of Monreith maps um, are, of Glen Luce and such like, um, and the sea around there is peppered with little people um, doing fishing and such like things. And here again, it's exactly the same. If we go back up to the, um, the bay, um, we are looking now um, at uh, a boat, a type, that was called a wherry. And when I first looked at these guys, I thought, oh, well, they're looking for shellfish on the bank there. Um, but they're not. They're not looking for shellfish at all. Um, and uh, I did a little work, and I asked a few people, and uh, a guy called David Collin uh, from Kukubri uh, wrote a little article about exactly this in uh, uh, January 2099, uh, 2019. Sorry. Um, he says, brief accounts have survived for the operators of three shell wherries. That's what that boat is. It's a shell wherry. William White, Alexander Kilpatrick, and John McClellan. The accounts refer to vessels that were clinker built and 10 to 12 tons burden. The activities of the shell gatherers and what they were doing was uh, just basically heaping up the shells, shells sticking it in the boat, and uh, taking it away for fertilizer. I told you I was going to go on about dung. And uh, the activities of the shell gatherers began usually in April and uh, from then till November or December. They worked night and day for six days a week. The long hours were necessary to use the tides to advantage, going downriver with the ebb, beaching near to the banks of shells on the shores of Balmangan or Ross Bay laboring to load their vessels to maximum capacity, then heading upriver as soon as they were, were refloated by the rising tide. Traveling onto the Taff and the Tongland ports, uh, they distributed their cargoes from there. Um, John McClellan, um, one of these ones that's referred to, um, probably not these guys, but someone really like this, um, uh, carried out his work for 22 years and made over 70 trips per season. Um, shells were a useful source of lime and used to fertilize farmland as far away as New Galloway. Um, and so we're talking about the trade up and down the Glen Kens again. Quarries also used for ferrying manure, seaweed, sand, and whinstone, funnily enough, which is quarried from Tors. Um, uh, from Little Ross, that's the little island we'll go to in a minute down at the bottom, and uh, even from the Isles of Fleet. Um, we know about these wherries. They've been ongoing for quite some time in this area um, because we have records of a wherry bringing timber from the Cree um, all the way to Kelton in the, in the Nith, on the Nith, um, and that was timber for the mid-steeple. Um, in 1704. Um, now, it's not just this little bit here, but in uh, 1847, it's still reported by the Topographical, Statistical and Historical Gazetteer of Scotland. Um, uh, he, they write about this particular area as well. And 
through all the waters, they write, uh, that wash the coast. Um, uh, sorry, though all the waters that wash the coast are rich in the fishy tribes, they rarely tempt the apathetic inhabitants of the coast to spend, uh, to spread the net or cast the line and have not prompted the erection of a single fishing village, nor of course the formation of a community of professed fishermen. Uh, in fact, this echoes uh, Defoe, who said exactly the same thing in 1725 about the Kubri guys. Seashells and shelly sands, however, um, which are thrown in great profusion, have greatly contributed to fertilize the adjacent grounds. And so we still have this going on in, in 1847. So we're looking at a, about 100 years of uh, putting shell onto the ground. Um, and... Uh, they are accompanied for lands to which it is more suitable by large supplies of seaweed. So that's something else that's also going on to the land. Graham, you, I think you were going to tell us a little bit more about people on this map. Yeah, there's a couple of wee things. One is to follow up the uh, comment I made about surveyors earlier on. Um, the just referring briefly back to the Earlston map that we were talking that we were looking at before that you were doing, Archie. Um, the Earlston estate was bought in the 1780s by William Forbes, uh, extremely wealthy man, and uh, he radically altered and enlarged the estate and had it resurveyed between 1800 and 1815 by a surveyor called James Anderson. Now, James Anderson, who was a Edinburgh surveyor, uh, happened to be noted as the assistant to James Jardin between 1813 and 18, and James Jardin was a Dumfries surveyor who'd made it big in Edinburgh, and James Jardin himself noted himself as the successor to John Gillam in 1809. So we've got a trail of surveyors right through back to John Gillam, uh, and John Gillam died at that, about that time. So, so that's the first bit, and the, the second bit is, yeah, looking briefly at um, again, the proprietors of the estate, um, the Earl of Selkirk, and in particular, his second son, Lord Dare, who was, the, uh, who was going to inherit the estate. Well, in 1786, if we just leave, leave it exactly where it is, Chris, that's great. In 1786, um, Lord Dare was given uh, the management of the estate by his father, and immediately he decided that he wanted to improve the roads. Now, We've all had a look at this particular road that's, that's tracing its way through, quite a major looking road. And Chris quite rightly said, that is overlaid on the map. It, it's not an original road, that's one that's been put on later. And I think this map was made by Gillen for Dare after 1786. I'll come on to that in a second. And then that road was added as one of the new roads that, uh, that Dare wanted to put onto his estates to improve the um, transfer of agricultural produce and possibly the uh, things like shells as well if they were going by land but certainly agriculture and uh, and it, it, what happened was that um, as part of Lord Dare's improvement of the roads it says he was assisted by a land surveyor John Gillen whom he trained in his methods and uh, not only did they do the, their own estate they then went all over the Stuart tree and for instance um, improved the road between Newton Stewart and New Galloway. That, that, was a, that was a Gillen project as well. Unfortunately, Dare died young in 1795, um, but Gillen was still appointed the county engineer, in other words, responsible for uh, building and improving roads in 1796, which post he continued to hold until the end of his life. Um, so that was, that's quite interesting. And there's one last thing to look at on the map which uh, I'm going to introduce and Archie's going to talk about. So if we carry on down the way right to the bottom of the map, and it's another ship we're going to look at. And there it is. So this is a very carefully drawn ship, as, as, you, can, as you can see, uh, with a particular style of flag. Uh, and we've, we're speculating again here, uh, but it's great fun. And I'll pass over to Archie to uh, carry on the speculation. Well, uh, thanks, Graham. Um, I had a natter with a few guys. Uh, thank you, Daniel, if you're listening in. Um, and 
Uh, also, thank you, Alistair, as well. Uh, we think that this just isn't any old ship with a, a fancy striped flag. We actually think that this is John Paul Jones's ship in 1778, just about to go round the corner and go to St. Mary's Isle to try and kidnap the Earl of um, Selkirk. Uh, the reasoning behind this is that the flag at the back um, is the old American Navy Jack. Um, uh, John Paul Jones appears to have had um, at least two different flags on board. Um, uh, he uh, flew the Stars and Stripes for the first time in Europe um, just before this voyage was made, and he um, got a salute for it from the uh, French fleet. Um, but he probably had this one on, which lasted for only about two or three years in the so-called American Navy, um, which uh, actually at this time existed, I think it was only about two or three ships in the whole of its Navy anyway. Um, and uh, this is, I think, a picture of that flag. The other thing that leads um, one to suspect that um, it's possibly John Paul Jones is he's got the guns run out, if you notice. Um, the number of cannons is wrong for his ship. The ship is called the Ranger. Um, uh, but if it was done from uh, hearsay and gossip, perhaps several years later, um, then uh, it's quite possibly um, a depiction of the Ranger. Um, I don't know. What does anybody else think? It's, it, is, it is speculation rather than uh, anything else. Well, uh, the thing I found strange, Archie, was that, that we've got this picture of the, of the Ranger, if it is, uh, and yet the Ranger at that point was on its way to raid the house of Lord Selkirk, who commissioned the map, uh, which seems like almost a bit of an insult, putting it on the map in the first place. So I think Gillen would not have done that if he hadn't known that the reaction of either Lord Dare or his father we're going to be uh, positive. So uh, if it is a depiction of the ranger, it must have been a sort of private in joke, I think. Um, I, I, th I think exactly the same. I think it, I think it was a, a private in joke, but the interesting part too, is that actually letters were going backwards and forwards between uh, John Paul Jones and the Selkirks um, because he was returning their silver, which, yeah his crew had nicked off, uh, nicked off them in the first place. And uh, it took about 10 years to return. Um, so there were these letters going backwards and forwards. So John Paul Jones was, um, uh, how do you put, somebody, somebody's put the flag would certainly be right for the American Navy. So there we are. Thank you, whoever that was. <laughs> um, but uh, I think that, um, well, just on the Alex, man, man, thank you, Alex, for send, sending that one in. And that is quite true. Uh, Dare was a member of the Society for Constitutional Information, which was a dangerous thing to belong to because the leaders of that society were actually tried for high treason in 1795 or 1794, uh, although they were um, acquitted. And Dare was in that, and so was his dad. So, um, so yes, they were radicals and might have seen a different side to things. Um, but uh, anyway, on the, on the letter front, these letters were going backwards and forwards. So John Paul Jones was in people's minds for the ensuing 10 years. It wasn't just something that happened and you forgot about it. It, it was something that was ongoing. So I can see this as being a, a, a family joke, if you like. Um, because, I mean, relationships between uh, John Paul Jones and, and the... Um, uh, Earl of Selkirk and his wife seem to have been quite jovial, really. They, they wrote each other fairly pleasant letters. There's one thing that's not been mentioned uh, tonight, and uh, Chris was meant to cover this, and I found it quite interesting. Maybe the rest of you out there are map experts. I'm certainly not. Uh, but Chris was meant to talk about the, the different ways of measuring maps, um, different chains, and uh, some of the... Um, Maybe the, the, uh, there seems to be a, a, a misunderstanding between different different units of measure in different parts of Scotland and different surveyors. Do you want to spend a couple of minutes talking about that, Chris, and maybe 
uh, explain on the difference between a, a, a Scottish chain, an English chain, and a British chain? Wow, yeah, uh, this is a very good question, uh, Nick, and I'm not going to give you a very good answer, uh, I'm afraid. But what I, what I can say is a little more about the standard ways of measuring land on these maps in the 18th century, which were nearly always using acres, uh, roods, and then falls. We saw that on the uh, Glen Capel map that Graham looked at. And an acre was, was 6,100. Uh, square yards and it derived from a sort of Anglo-Saxon word meaning a field so it was the the area corresponding to a ploughed field and this was divided into four roods so a rood was 1525 square yards and that was then divided into 40 square falls so the fall was 38 square yards and so those those basic measures were, were used across Scotland, but there were all sorts of variant ideas on each of those definitions. Each of those words was interpreted in different ways, especially when you went over the border into, into England. And the same was true of the standard surveyor's chain. Very often these maps are measured in chains to the inch. The chain was about 25 yards long. Uh, so that was about four falls and 10 chains added together made a furlong of 247 yards and then eight furlongs uh, were calculated together to, to make a, a mile. Now the Acts of Union in particular introduced English measures into uh, Scotland because the Scots mile was longer than the, the English mile. Um, but in general, throughout the 18th century, we find the, the Scots measures used predominantly, and very often Scots and English measures appear on these uh, estate maps. Before really the Weights and Measures Act in 1824, which uh, was the final kibosh on a lot of the, uh, the, the Scots measures, and thereafter we tend to find a standard British uh, imperial measurement system uh, used throughout. If I could um, just uh, do a little promo for DAMP, um, uh, just to say we do have, uh, I, I reckon, are there about a couple of hundred maps, Graham? Yeah, maybe a bit less than that that I've done, but I think you've probably got some as well. So I've, I've got, I've got a few. Yeah, I, I've got, a, well, I've got a few more than, than you've got, and so yeah. we'll be coming up to another couple of hundred maps. But we're, we're covering an area just north of New Galloway um, very extensively up to Cast Fairn. Um, and uh, then there's, uh, uh, well, the ones down at Calaverate um, that we've seen a copy of one today um, and uh, various other ones as well. Um, so uh, keep an eye out on the NLS site and do head to the NLS site too. The other thing I'd like to say is that we do have uh, a Facebook page if anybody's on Facebook. Thank you very much to Graham. Thank you very much to Chris. And thank you very much for Archie. We have been very game. This has been the very first time our team at Galloway Glen's has attempted to do this. Uh, and I think uh, if you could all applaud at home, that would be great. And maybe <laughs> do that um, for their time and effort to actually move forward on this. So thank you, everyone.